Oh, this is. Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah. You can hear me? All right, good. So, this is a very special presentation. It's very unique, very targeted for landowners who want to learn how to attract, not only attract, but also how to sustain backyard wildlife. Now, this isn't uh, put up a bird feeder here or put up sewage, sewage cakes over here. This is in depth. Talk, we're going to talk about native plants. We're going to talk about a lot of different things, all the different techniques that you can use to uh, to attract wildlife. But not only wildlife, but to attract wild, the, the exact wildlife that you want to see, the target wildlife. So if you want to see, uh, you know, eastern bluebirds, you, know, you can learn exactly what you have to do to attract eastern bluebirds. All right. So it's a very specific class. So hopefully you'll get a lot of out of out of it today. Okay. So. Again, my name is uh, Casey Tompkins, and just so you know, I'm not some nutball off the street. All right, I'll give you a little background on myself. Um, I, I originally went to Dutchess Community College for business. All right, way back in way back in the day, and I decided that, that was way too boring and easy. So I decided to uh, pursue um, pursue e ecological studies. So I decided to uh, go off to SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Where I studied under some pretty, pretty renowned um, biologists. I graduated uh, from there and uh, immediately started working with turtles in the Upper Hudson River for companies like General Electric and New York State DOT. Um, basically, what I was doing was studying the population of turtles in New York State. So I spent a couple of years doing that as well. Um, after that, I, I got the luxury of going down to Florida for about three and a half years where I worked with threatened and endangered species. So I worked with some alligators. Um, go for tortoises and also worked with wetlands and um, all types of conservation and mitigation and stuff like that. Then I decided after getting bit way too much, <laughs> way too much heat, I mean look at me, I am pale skin, I'm an Irish man, I do not, I do not burn very, very well at all. So I, I decided to come back up to the mountains where I really, really like it. Um, so I've been up, back up here for about, I don't know, about five years now. And since being back up, I've been certified as a professional ecologist and wetland scientist. Um, New York State DEC licensed rattlesnake handler and uh, relocator. Uh, I have a number of den sites that are responsible for me and me only. Um, and on my spare time, I practice what's referred to as reconciliation ecology, which is really essentially why we're all here. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, as you can see, there's a few po photos up there. There's one on the left there on the top, that's a timber rattlesnake. Um, that is a threatened species in New York State. The one on the right is a very, very large uh, rat snake. Um, looks a little bit bigger because of the angle, so, you know, makes the fish look this big. In actuality, it's not that big. And that is a 55 pound uh, male snapping turtle that I took uh, at a Columbia County wetland during a presentation on snapping turtles. That was a very, very fun event. And that, there's another one coming up in August, so if you have kids and you want to go, it's, it's really a great event. So, I have one question. Do you have the fever? Does anyone here have a fever? Sir, do you have the fever? Do I have a fever? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no? No. Not that I know. <laughs> Ma'am, do you have the fever? I have spring fever. Yeah, spring fever. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Anyone, uh, anyone, everyone feeling all right? You don't have a fever? Nothing? The fever I'm talking about is called biophilia. All right, it's your innate love for nature. That's a fever. All right, the only reason why I call it a fever is because that's something that we've lost and it's something that everybody is starting to gain again. All right, you're, we're slowly starting to catch up from each other. All right, so it's similar in how we're going to farmers markets nowadays, right? We're doing back, we're doing all types of stuff to our backyards. It's something that we're we're into now, right? We're, we're gaining it from each other. We're, we're getting excited and happy about it, right? It's the same thing. Now, I'll tell you someone that really has the fever. To me, it's a religious. This guy. To me, it's a religious thing to me. Yeah, but this guy here, he's got the fever. <laughs> right? That's my boxer. He caught it. All right, he got it. <laughs> he's definitely got it. All right. This guy might not have the fever. What do we see in a picture like this? Anyone? Manicured lawn. Manicured lawn. All right. What is that lawn feeding? Um, you mean animals or what do you animals? Animals, yeah. Is it doing anything? It depends if there's grubs on it. <laughs> Maybe grubs. <laughs> Maybe grubs. So it's constant. <laughs> right. So it's a sterile lawn. It's not going to seed, right? So finches aren't being fed, nothing, right? Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you have it long like this, there's really nothing to be ashamed of, in my opinion. This, this is the way it is nowadays, right? This is just, this is it. This is what people are trained to do. You, you mow your yard every Saturday or Sunday. You know, you, you, you prune your bushes up front that are exotic species. They don't, they, you know, they're from China or something like that. They're not feeding anything, right? So we have a very sterile property here, right? Very, very boring in my opinion, but it's not for everybody. Now, when I see something like this, I, I picture what they could do with it. And that's what I'm picturing. I'm picturing a field full of golden rods, right? a solid ago, right? I'm picturing uh, bushes like high bush, high bush blueberry, or perhaps a wet prairie, or a forested area with a nice ground layer of leaves and decomposing matter, all types of good stuff. That's what I'm picturing, right? Because this is feeding nothing. It's a dead green green. Right. That's not. There's nothing going on here. All right. I, we should we should be fair and say that there's just there's not nothing going on, but it's very very little going on, right? Yeah. But when we turn to something like this, right, you're doing a lot more. You're not only supplying uh, for for in case let's look at the goldenrod area. Okay, you're not only supplying land for or an opportunity for bumblebees and insects, but you're also supplying an opportunity for everything that eats bumblebees and insects, and then you're supplying opportunity for everything that eats those guys. Right, so this is just a huge opportunity for a large amount of wildlife, right? Diverse amount of wildlife. If we look at the forest community, it's the same thing there. I mean, wet prairie, right? So if we take that property and we take all four of these and we put them all in together, right? Now we have four complex communities all coming in together, right? So certain species of wildlife prefer the goldenrod, right? The solidagos and all the, the flowery stuff, okay? The meadows. Certain species prefer shrubby areas, certain species prefer wooded areas, and certain species prefer wet, wet prairies, wet meadows. So if you have all four of these in one spot, what's going to happen? You've got all these species coming out of nowhere, and they're all kind of hanging out in the same spot. right? So you've got four communities, all these different wildlife are picking from each one because they like this one, this one likes this one, this one likes this one, and you get them all in one spot together. Right? That's a valuable community right there. okay? But in this, you're just not getting that at all, right? You're taking away from the opportunity for wildlife to come in. It's actually a, it's, it's so simple, it's, it's amazing. Um, and, um, we'll get into it a little bit, let's see. All right, so look, let's look at this. My experience down in Florida, okay, this is um, a saw palmetto flat, is what they call it, all right, or a zero oak habitat. And uh, you know, as you can see, very hot, one of the reasons why I came back, you can just feel the heat radiating, up, radiating off the picture. All right, and this is what happens. That's ex that's the exact same picture of what the other one was, except this is what happens. Right, this is for the mining industry. Right, anyone? This is for phosphate, so we use it for our food and everything. So, you know, there's not one person in this room that's not responsible for this happening, and we have to come to a you know realization that that's true. Okay, you're using phosphate, you know, you're driving around, or it doesn't matter. You're using a resource. You are you have a footprint. So it's, it's up to us to, to try to mitigate for that loss in some way or another. Okay? So we had that nice Zurich oak habitat that now is nothing more than, you know, it's going to be nothing more than a field of exotic plants okay, in Florida. All right? But why do we really care? I mean, it's just, it's just a habitat, right? Well, that's because it's associated with gopher tortoises, which are a threatened species in Florida. All right, we've got uh, the Florida mouse, which is an endangered species, the uh, scrub, scrub jay, and then we also have um, the black snake, all of which are listed species in Florida. So we take an entire habitat and we wipe it out, and now four, four listed species do not have a place to go. But it's not just about the listed species, it's all the commensal species associated with them. All right, so it's just not those four, it's hundreds, hundreds of species that we just lost. Now, do you think that a habitat like that is easy to put back? Absolutely not. That's never gonna be back like that. And I'll tell you right now why it means a lot to me is because I was right there. I was there, I saw it all happen. I mean, for, a, for an ecologist, I mean, that's something that's heartbreaking. It's terrible because you, you, you know what lives there. 
and you know that habitats like that cannot simply be created again. They're never going to be perfect again. Not like that. They can't be. Okay, so that, that, that was a killer. But it's okay. We're going to be all right. And let's see. Okay. Let's, be, let's have a happy moment, right? Because it's all right. We've got it's good news. We're going to be able to make this thing work. Let's watch this cool video that I took. Bring everybody back up, all right? Bring some positivity into the room. How big is that tortoise? A tortoise. A tortoise is about this big. Okay. And it's yes. a gopher tortoise? It is. This is a tortoise that I saved from that land. Now, he's been released. Turtle man. Turtle man. Yeah. That's right. So the tortoise has been released. Now I'm videoing. Now, you think tortoises are slow. Oh, just wait. <laughs> Look at that tortoise go. Where's the heaven? Well, he's not headed anywhere soon because, uh, uh here it comes. Oh! There! <laughs> I got him. <laughs> there he is. And the tortoise has been captured again. But this is the habitat that that tortoise had to be dropped off at, which is a adjacent habitat to what was destructed, okay? Now, this looks nothing like what I took him from, which was the unfortunate thing. Will that tortoise survive? Yes, he probably will but he will not be in a habitat that is quote unquote suitable for his long-term existence, all right? So, reconciliation ecology, what is it? All right, and we're getting to some of the fun stuff here soon, so give me a minute. We have reconciliation ecology, it's something more, it's a branch of ecology that studies the close interactions between human beings and animals. Okay, and what it does is it looks for opportunities to create habitat in the spaces that we've occupied. Okay, so instead of having a full lawn, they think, okay, we'll have a meadow instead, and then just a walking path up to your door. Things, things like that, all right? Uh, so individually, working towards attracting and sustaining wildlife will mitigate for some of our destruction. We will never, ever be able to 100% compensate for what we've lost, right, or what we've done to the environment. But... It's the individual landowner, and I really mean this when I say it, it's the individual landowner that is going to be the one that really makes the difference. Right? Because no matter what happens, we are going to be, there's always going to be building. There's always going to be more stores going up. There's always going to be parking lots going in. That's going to happen. But it's the individual landowner that can create native plant habitats. You know, uh, really, I mean, really just create the habitats that are required for species in the area to survive. So if you, yes? Are, are there any tick resistant plants or tick vegetation that you can put in along the walkway so not be less likely for the... Uh, you know? I mean, well, we're going to get to that. Yeah. We're, I'm not going to say there's tick resistant plants, yeah. but with a yard that is diverse in a plant community, not only, not only brings in ticks, but also brings in the other insects that eat those ticks. Right. Right? It's about having a well-balanced community is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that, I promise. All right, so let's, let's move ahead here for a minute. All right, so very simply, very, very simply, the resources required for you to attract wildlife and sustain it is food, rest, cover, and water. Simple, four things. And those people that complain about having problematic wildlife usually have food, rest, cover, and water. Cover can be, okay, you're, you have you know, 400 tires, used tires in your backyard. Okay, guess what's gonna settle in? You know, you're gonna have you know, mammals in your backyard, they're gonna be living under your tires, you're gonna be hanging out, right? Food, you leave your trash cans open, raccoons are gonna come by, okay? You've got uh, resting opportunities, all right? Say you have some exotic shrubbery in your backyard and that's just filling in the whole thing. Well, that's a resting opportunity for, for wildlife, okay? Water, you know, you can have, you know, a, a pond in your backyard or you can have a artificial water resource, you know, that, that's what water, that's what I refer to as water, not a bird bath. I'm talking about an actual artificial water source, okay? 
And uh, all right, so again, the four things that we need is food, rest, cover, and water. All right, and then we will succeed. But it goes a little bit deeper than that. All right, because if I was to give you the one essential ingredient, the one thing that is not debatable by anybody for having this whole thing work out, tracking whatever wildlife you want, it's native plants. You need them. You need to have them. I mean, it's simple as that. All right, we are. We are prone to go to the local nursery and to pick out the plants that we really don't know anything about. We just know it's got this pretty purple flower on it and it says it attracts butterflies. Well, the problem is, is that plant is from Japan and it may attract butterflies, but it only feeds it. It doesn't allow it to actually fulfill its entire life cycle. If you don't have butterflies, you know, if they're not able to reproduce, you're not going to have butterflies for the, from the go-to, right? It's just not going to happen. Right. So the native plant community is the foundation for you, all of your success. From here on out, consider that the foundation. If you do not have it, you will not succeed. You won't forget it. Right? Because without that, you're not drawing in the insects that are required to feed those lovely birds that you want to see every morning. Right? You're not going to have, you're not going to have the butterflies coming in. Okay? You're not going to have different wildlife, different snakes and all types of fun stuff experience. The complexity will determine the diversity of wildlife. If you put one species of milkweed in your garden, what is that going to do? It's going to attract maybe, what, five butterflies? butterflies? Maybe some butterflies, right? Moderate butterflies. Maybe moderate butterflies, exactly, right. But what if you were to put in milkweed and button bush, and cone flowers, and black-eyed Susans, do you think that other species would like to come by too? The complexity of the communities that's in our yards, okay, will total to a diverse and abundant wildlife community. All wildlife has a target community type, or what's suitable to them. So remember that while you can't go wrong in planting native plants, if you're looking for something specific, you have to do a little bit of research. Okay? Because all wildlife prefers something in particular. Okay? A target community type. Right? If I say, oh, I mean, you know, I'm not going to put bamboo and you're not going to get some Japanese species coming from Japan or anything like that. All right? But what will happen is if you plant shag bark hickory trees all right, and you put it in a big moth garden, 30 years from now, guess what you're going to be attracting? Indiana bats. All right? You're going to be attracting long-eared bats, all types of good stuff. All right? So those species prefer those types of trees. Those are bat trees. All right? So depending on what you want to see, that will help you determine what plants to put in the ground. All right? And just a reminder, too, that if you, a plant in your garden has fed nothing, it has definitely not done its job. Okay, think of this as an overall system. Right, you put it in your yard and it doesn't allow it to go to seed. Right, it's not feeding anything. Right, so the, life, the cycle has been broken. It doesn't even exist. It's not even there to begin with. Say you take half of your yard and you say, okay, I'm going to allow meadow to come in instead. And the other half, I'll just keep mowing. Right, now all of a sudden, you've got golden rods and you've got all types of meadow species but are prairie species right, that are being are feeding insects, butterflies, grassland birds, avian predators. You've got it all now. Right? You've got a community that's starting to develop. All right? So the plant has to feed something. All right? Native plants always will feed something. Okay? All right, so native plants. We're not talking about putting a five or six native bushes in the front of your house and leaving them evenly spaced out and you know thinking that that's gonna fix everything because that's just not the case all right because the density of the plant community will also increase the diversity and abundance of wildlife all right so we need to have you know we need to have a tree canopy okay we need to have a shrub canopy or shrub layer and a herbaceous layer all right so this is what I refer to as a tree a tree canopy large trees and then shrubs underneath those and then also plants, uh, smaller plants are that, herbaceous plants. Right? Because it's the strata, okay, 
the canopy, the subcanopy, the shrub, and the herbaceous layer, all right, is what's going to actually end up attracting the wildlife that we want to see. Do you need all four? No, you don't. Absolutely not. But if you had all four, you get all best of all worlds, right? Because you have a number of species that want to come into each strata. Okay, when I say strata, I mean like the layer, right? So all the trees, and then the, the sub canopy, or like the smaller trees, and then the shrubs underneath that, and then the smaller plants under that, okay? Because remember, all wildlife is specific to certain types of plants or certain types of communities, okay? So anyone, anyone, anyone know what that one is? Snowberry, you ever heard of snowberry? Anyone that has, um, has a penny, write this one down. This is awesome for the winter. Snowberry is a, obviously a native plant. It's great for birds, excellent for birds, and it has a bright red berry in the winter. So it's highly attractive, I highly recommend it. It does really well in like upland sites. You know, it can also do well in, um, in uh, areas of shade. So if you have shaded areas in your property, you can plant them in there as well. But that's a terrific resource for birds. I actually took a, a relatively large area of my property and put in snowberry plantings. So eventually, that would just be a big snowberry patch. Okay, so all the birds will be feeding there every winter, and I wouldn't have to go out and say feed the birds. Right? They're going to be fed by themselves by the snowberries. Right? Uh, of course, the golden rods, go with them. I love the golden rods. You've got to do them. All right. all right, so selecting your native plants. We touched base on this a little bit but it really helps knowing what's next to you on your property. Okay, if you're standing on a property that's all mowed down, what's next to you over here? All right, I've got, you know, I've got sugar maples and I've got oak trees. Well, typically if you want to reforestate, reforest your property, you want to do sugar maple and you want to do oak. Whatever did well over here is definitely going to do okay over here, right? So you want to move that stuff over. You want to create the habitat again. That's always advantageous. Or if you knew what it used to be, and there's online resources for that, you can also work towards that as well. Um, and remember, the specific species of plants should be selected to attract and sustain the wildlife that you're interested in getting. I can't say that enough. All right? So don't just put all these plants in and expect, oh, I cannot wait to see bluebird. Well, you, know, you have to actually target that animal with the specific plants. Okay. So, And then the proper site selection is, is important too. So you, know, you don't want to take a plant that lives in a wetland and put it in the upland. Okay? That's just not going to work out. All right, so that's, that's important. And again, as long as you go native, you really can't go wrong, okay? You're going to get some wildlife, all right? You just plant overwhelming. As many species as you can, you put in the ground. All right. All right, so what's another thing that we need on the, on the property besides native plants? We need cover, all right? We need somewhere for the animals to go to feel comfortable. Uh, cover can be in the form of rocks, it could be down debris, it could be logs, it could be stumps, all types of stuff. We're trained to go outside and pick up the tree that just fell down in our yard, right? Which, you know what? I get it. I understand you got neighbors. They're going to drive by. Oh, Mr. Smith, what a wacko. He's not, he hasn't picked up that tree in months or years, right? I mean, we're also trained. We've got to go outside and we're going to rake up our yard. We're going to pick up all the leaves every, you know, every fall, right? What if we were to leave a small patch of our property unraked? What if we, were, we could leave a portion of our property with timber down, right? What is that doing? Right? It's creating cover for animals, right? That cover, that standing snag or that tree is providing cover for a list of wildlife, small mammals, large, you know, some medium-sized mammals, right? but also bats too, right? Birds, as soon as that falls, now we've got an entirely different community a different microhabitat that's been created. Now we're talking about salamanders, we're talking about snakes, we're talking about voles, we're talking all types of good stuff. And that's what we want around, right? Because no, no animal all right, is gonna wanna go on your property and not feel safe about being there, okay? Because it feels vulnerable. Think about it in, in their perspective. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk out into this grassy field while that hawk guy is over there flying around, I'm not gonna do that, all right? But if I have a meadow, and inside that meadow, I have some, some rock piles, maybe, or I have some fallen logs or, or big trees. I'll crawl under those. I'll feel more comfortable, right? So that's the cover aspect of it, right? And that could be, again, decaying logs and debris and you know, all types of stuff, right? All right, so like, this is the microhabitat that I was talking about, the small-scale environments. If you have a small backyard, 
you have a great opportunity to create microhabitats. Right? You know what? People say it's ugly and, and you know why do you have that tree stump sitting there? You know, I think it's actually pretty, pretty, pretty nice looking, pretty beautiful. All right, you got the tree stump there, you got some native species around it, you got Rebecca and all types of golden rods. I mean it looks beautiful, right? And I guarantee you there's something living under that log, right? You've got salamander community, you got something going on there. Right? You're offering a habitat, right? You're giving that up. You're saying, you know what? I'm sorry that I took this from you and I'm gonna put it back. I'm giving you this, right? I mean, that, feel, that feels great when it's done, I promise you, all right? One really, really cool idea for anyone that's interested in uh, what's referred to as more or less commensalism or somewhere as you benefit, but so does the animal, is mushroom farming. It's really, really neat, right? So you've got a four or five foot large lot. They may have 12 or 20 of them or 50 of them, right? They're laying on the ground and you're actually injecting uh, spores into the logs and they're growing mushrooms for you to eat, all right? But what, what else is it doing? Anybody? What else is it doing by laying there? It's creating the habitat, right? What's living under there? Um, salamanders, worms. Yeah. All types of good stuff. Maybe some toads, right? So you're getting something from it and so are they. You're not using chemicals, no pesticides, herbicides, nothing. But they're also winning, and so are you. That is exactly what reconciliation ecology is. Is you're taking something from the environment, right? But you're also giving something back. So you have a plus plus. Everyone wins, right? No issues. Salamanders have a place to live, chemical free. You get mushrooms from it for five years, three to five pounds of mushroom per log per year. I mean, that's an incredible opportunity that we're just kind of giving up. We're not thinking about. And you don't have to go to the store and buy mushrooms. Right. So, some additional wildlife enhancements, right? One, reduce or eliminate your use of pesticides. Just don't use them. Do not use them. Maybe have a small portion of your yard, okay, where you use chemical, and that's it. The rest of it, fill it in with plants. Creating the microhabitat, right, like the stumps and the trees that have fallen down, the rock crevices. Okay, and then these linear green passages or wildlife corridors, right? So instead of having a, a, an area just uh, you know, completely mowed down, right, and goes all the way to your neighbor's house, now you're going to have a small corridor that separates your neighbor from yourself that you're going to allow filled in with golden rods and all types of, uh, you know, panicum grasses and love grasses, right, and shrubs. You're creating a corridor for plants to be able to move or animals to be able to move through so that they feel um, comfortable and able to pass through to get to the next piece of property. One of the biggest problems in this country, all right, forget about rainforest, Forget about Costa Rica and all those places. We've got problems right here, all right? We've got a very, very small amount of natural land left in this country, very small. And the problem is, is those small areas that are left, they're isolated, okay? And when, when animals become isolated, their genetic diversity, okay, it becomes minimal and it's dying because they're not able to breed with animals that are over in that nature preserve. But if there was a corridor, Okay, or a link to allow them to get together, we would have a much better, much better case, right? We'd be able to mitigate for some of that loss, okay? And that's the biggest problem for diversity today, right? Animals cannot get together, all right, to be able to breed, right? They're separated, right? They're just, they're stuck in one spot or over there or over here, right? And those are our natural lands now, right? That, that's what's going on. So, you know, we, we, can, we can bash on some of these you know, South American countries or places of rainforest we're destroying, but we're doing much, much worse to our own country. It just doesn't make any sense. Who are we to say that to them? Is that the problem with the Florida puma? Yes, absolutely. Where does the Florida puma have to go? In not too many places. <laughs> no. Right? They're made, they and can't they, go up and the thing is, anymore. is they could say, we have 100 acres to protect this species. Great. How many, how many of those species, how many, how many individuals can actually survive in that 100 acres, all right, without be, becoming pretty much extinct in a way? 
all right, they're genetically isolated, all right, and they call it genetic drift. It's, it's something where they essentially just die. All right, they don't have diversity, all right, for change for to be able to to be able to change with the environment, with the temperature increases, with the, the change in the outer environment. They don't have that opportunity. They have to be able to breed to do that. All right, so you can have. You know, 100 puma in the 100 acres and say, oh, this is great, everything's good. No, it's not good because over time, they're going to die anyway. It's just, it's over for them, you know? Sad, but true. Oh, okay. No, I didn't finish it. Oh, so allow snags. You know, those snags are up in your property. You know, they got big holes in them. They look like they're dangerous. trees. They're going to fall over. You know, I understand that they're, they're a potential threat, but whenever possible, allow them to, allow them to stay up. Right, because they're utilized by bats and birds and all types of wildlife. Right? That's the stuff you want to, want to keep up. And when that stuff falls, you leave it lying. Right? Push it, you know what? Even push it into the spot that you want to see. Allow it to separate you from your neighbor. Instead, plant some nice, uh, nice native plants around it. Right? Make a nice little community there. Just, you know what? It looks, you know, have you ever seen a pine tree over years after it's fallen? It looks completely worn. It, it almost looks like a seating chair. But that stuff looks really, really cool. And I mean, it's different than what your neighbor is. You know, it, everything is so, so similar nowadays. Everybody's property is exactly the same. It, it's, it's really neat to be able to explore these different opportunities. Kind of differentiate yourself. Um, so install wildlife nesting boxes. Yes, this is okay. This is all right. Because you know what? We have to. Uh, with all the snags falling down and people cutting up all their trees, and the trees nowadays not really up to optimal size to be able to support wildlife. We have to turn to be able to turn to nest boxes, all right? Until we get our trees back or our habitats back, nest boxes are pretty much essential, all right? And we'll talk a little bit about the placement too. Um, if possible, and start art, install an artificial pond. Really neat. It's an entirely different community in itself, right? You can do pickerel weed and all types of different uh, wetland plants. And I promise you. After we go through all this, we're going to go through some specific cases to help you all build something that you want to build, okay? If you're ever interested and you want to do some research on your own, some really cool opportunities you can do. This is an Indiana bat, by the way. The New York Natural Heritage Program, for example, all right, the New York State DUC, they have an online resource that actually allows you to fill in some information. You can select out your property on their website. All right, and then they will tell you if there are any listed wildlife on your property, so threatened or endangered species. And if I were you, if I found out that, okay, I've got the New England cottontail in range of my home, which is a, a species that is potentially going to be listed, I'm going to say, okay, what habitat does this animal like? Right, I know that they like to have the, the, the prairies, okay, and the meadows, but they also like to have a lot of cover in the form of logs and you know, fallen branches and stuff like that. You know what? I'm going to target. I'm going to target that animal, right? So that resource allows you to determine that what wildlife is on my property that is listed that I can help. United States Fish and Wildlife Service, right? The I, it's called the IPAC system. It's the federal list, all right? They'll do the same thing. What are the federally listed animals that are on my property? I know that Indiana bats have a flight corridor near my property, or say there's a debt, there's a um, there's a basking area near my property. Oh, okay, Indiana bats. I'm gonna target them. I'm gonna I'm gonna work with them. The Natural Resources Conservation Service is all about your soil on your property, so you can actually go on. You can select your soil profile. You can determine a whole host of information. You can you can determine whether your property is actually kind of wet. Can it tolerate wetland plants? Or is it rather dry or all types of soil permeability, all types of this stuff. And last but not least is, is the DEC Environmental Resource Mapper. It does the same thing. It tells you where your where all your wetlands are, all right? It tells you is, is it a state wetland, what type of wetland it is. Um, do you have any rare ecological communities? It tells you all types of information. And you know what? They're extremely easy to use. So don't be nervous about going on and using them. And they're very helpful. So you can go on and ask any questions that you want. I did one for right here in Columbia County, actually near Tivoli. And for the IPAC system, it came up with the Indiana bat, the long-eared bat, the New England cottontail, and the bob turtle. Can you guess which one that one is? <laughs> hmm? no. right, so those are the species that I came up with. So this, 
let's create something here, all right? Let's think about what we can do for the Indiana bat and the long-eared bat. No. Yeah, all right, so let's go back to our property, all right? We're gonna have like a little, like a little workshop here. You guys are gonna tell me what you think we should do for those species. All right, first, let's think about, I'll give you a little background information, okay, on the bat, so you have an idea, all right? <clears throat> bats, all right, long-eared bats and Indiana bats. First of all, long-eared bats are proposed for listed to endangered. Um, Indiana bats are endangered. They've got some issues of, actually, for the first time, it's, it's actually a result of a fungus known as the white nose syndrome. Right? So they've been killing off all the bats, not all of them, but a good, good majority of them. But they've also got a lot of other problems as well. Right? Habitat loss is a major issue. Why do we want bats around, by the way? Pollination. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, pollination is true. Not in this area, but out west, absolutely, and it's huge. Yep. Um, they eat a thousand mosquitoes a day or something. Yeah, crazy. where'd you learn that? I worked in animal hospital. Okay. This stuff. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yep. Actually, it's uh, I believe it's somewhere around the vicinity of about ten thousand oh, per night. A lot more. Yeah. <laughs> what else do bats do? Anything? What do you think? Fertilize. Fertilize? Yeah. They actually do. Sure. I'm not gonna take that away from you. Yeah. But let's see, what do what do the gov what does the government really care about? Summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. If we did not have bats, right, we would have much more insects than we do now. What are those insects gonna do to our crops? Yeah. So why do you think that there is such a concern for bats in this country? Because of the loss to our agricultural industry. Right? Why do you think that uh, the federal government has a big uh, issue with uh, wet, certain types of wetlands? Right? Well, because if those wetlands are, um, if they're hurt and they, they cloud the downstream waters, the fishing licenses that people buy every year, they're just not going to buy them anymore. And so that's not going to support your, you know, your federal government, your, all your other programs. Right? So when we get to a case like bats, you know that they're important when they end up in the news. Okay. The populations are declining, we're having serious problems. Okay. So, the, let's just say the two types of bats, they overwinter in caves, all right? They come out in the spring, all right? They're gonna hang out in trees, rock crevices, things like that, all right? Things that they eat, mosquitoes, insects, all types of different bugs, all right? One thing that they really like to be near is streams and ponds lakes, water resources, all right, because they're relying on the insects and stuff that are metamorphosizing and coming out and they're flying around and they're consuming them, right? So that's why our streams are also really important is because if they're, if they're dirty, if they've got chemicals in it, there's certain types of insects that are not going to be able to make it, right? So stone flies, uh, mayflies, if those aren't around, bats aren't going to have enough to eat, right? So they're going to start to struggle, okay? So those are important as well. So they've got a host of problems. But now we've got this property here, and let's just say uh, Mr. Smith has decided, you know what, I listened to Casey's lecture, I got the, I got the uh, sickness, I have biophilia now, and uh, I want to do something really good on my property. Does anyone have any ideas of what we can do for the, for the long-eared bat or the Indiana bat? What's one of the, some of the things that we can do? Um, I think they need like a southern exposure, so if you have a barn or something, you can put up a bat house. Correct. On the southern exposure. Correct. Right. And so that goes into actual proper site selection for a bat box, right? Mm -hmm. Southern exposure is really important because they want to be able to, they're mammals, they need to be heated, all right? They're not reptiles, all right? They need to get that warmth, all right? So if they have a southern exposure to the sun, they're going to be able to stay warm during the day while they're actually roosting or hanging out underneath trees or bat boxes, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very important. So bat boxes is one thing that we can do, all right? We want to put up bat boxes. And you have a number of opportunities to do that. You can, you can do a single, single layer bat box where you just hang it up on your house, okay? Or you can go right out into your field. You can erect a 12 foot four by four, and then you could put uh, a very large bat box on top of that. And believe it or not, they work really, really well. You can go out there, you know, matter of, matter of weeks probably, and find bats under there. And before, before you know it, 
as they begin to you know, rear their young, which is usually one to three pups per year, right? They start coming back as well. So before you know it, you have a pretty nice little you know hangout of bats, right? And they're around the property, they're eating the insects, right? It's free insect control. You're not like you're not giving them a paycheck for this. <laughs> You know, you're, you're going, you're buying the 4x4, four four, you're putting up the bat box, and, and man, that's free service. It's a free service that, you know, is protecting your nearby garden. You have a garden and you don't want to be torn up by all types of, or you don't want to walk out your house and get bit by mosquitoes, put up a bat box, right? It helps. It's natural, there's nothing wrong with that. All right, so bat boxes, what else can we do? Well, people have a lot of fear of bats uh -huh. because of the transfer of rabies, which is... Sure. So it's real, but you know, it's, it, and then it, they right. say if the bat is acting normal, which is right. they they fly crazy, pretty much, that's normal. Right. If they're on the ground, that's not normal. Right. Stay away from them. Right. So, and, and I mean, do you think about the the percentage of the time that we actually run into a situation like that? It's just yeah. nil. Well, it really is. It's nil. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so what else can we do to enhance property? We can't just put up a bat box and be like, all right, I've done my, I've done my duty. We're good. Bats are going to be great. My kids are going to see them one day, you know. We're all going to work. It's all going to work out. What else can we do? Water source and pond. Right. So maybe we can put it, in, if you're not near uh, a stream or a lake or something, right, you can put it in like a small artificial pond. A very small pond the size of even this, this table, you know, it, it can allow for mosquitoes and all types of bugs and insects to actually develop in it. Right, and give off, I and mean, that, that's, you know, don't forget too, I mean, your wetland plants that you can add, and, and, and you know, logs and mosses and all types of good stuff. You know, it really spruces up, you know? But that's, a, that's another thing that we can do, is an artificial resource. Anything else? There's plenty more. What do you think? Um, play the garden? What kind of garden? Um, butterfly bushes? What if we did like um what if we did like a moth garden? What if we did a moth garden or butterfly garden? What do you think? When do moths fly? Day? Or night? Probably night. Probably night. Some some of them fly during the day, but most of them fly at night, right? When do bats fly around? Day. Bats. Bats. Night. Come on, Batman, who's always out at night, right? So we've got moths flying out, now, flying around at night. Now we have bats flying around at night, right? Do you see how that kind of makes sense? All right. So my first line does is if I came to someone's house and they said, "I want bats," okay. First thing we got to do for the future, for long-term planning, we're going to install hickory trees. White oak trees and sugar maples. Specifically, shag bark hickory, shale bark hickory, pig nut hickory. Why? Why are those trees so special? Does anyone know? Because of their bark. Right. It's exfoliating, right? It's hanging out. And there, there's, there's an understanding that evolution, right, between the bat and the shag bark hickory took place. Bats started working themselves up underneath the bark. And over time, the bark began to exfoliate more and more and more. I walked into some shag bark hickory forests with trees that are just, I can't even begin to tell you how big they are. And the exfoliating bark on them is about the size of my leg. Right? And there's bats just hanging out under all that. Right? That is a huge, that's what I refer to as a maternal roosting colony. All right? A spot where all the female bats get together and they take care of their babies. All right? Those are the habitats that we're losing. That's a big problem. So in, in order to prepare for the future, all right, and to feel like you've done something good, you say, all right, you know what? I'm gonna have a shag bar hickory forest here one day. I want my kids to see it. I want them to know that I put this here for the bats. And I want them to take care of it. Well, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna put 20 hickory trees in. Maybe 15, 10, 30, whatever. All right, and maybe you wanna do some white oaks and some sugar maples as well. Because white oaks have the plates on them, right? So the bats kind of wiggle in between them and they just kind of sit there during the day like this, right? On a southern exposure, usually, right? Sugar maples, same thing, right? They get so big and they just have this exfoliating bark, right? It's very important for them. But we always get back to increasing the plant diversity, all right, too, right? Because we want maybe a patch of goldenrod or some, um, you know, 
a very large meadow nearby or something like that, right? Because we want a lot of insects coming in, right? Because we want something for the bats to be able to feed on, right? So remember, all right, we want bats, so we need food, cover, all right? We need rest opportunities, and then we also need, we need like water, we need artificial resource. So practicing moth in our butterfly gardening is huge if you want to attract bats, all right? If you want to attract them and sustain them on your property. I've got bats that hang out in my house for the past few years now. And I've got so many moths, all right? So many moths and butterflies, my wife's just terrified of them when they come in the door, right? But that's why she likes the bats so much now is because she knows that they're consuming the moths, right? And so in the bat boxes, right? Until those trees get big enough, they need a place to go. So we're going to install some, some bat boxes, right? You can put a big Batman symbol on or something. Kind of make it exciting if you'd like. All right. <clears throat> Reducing or eliminating the use of your pesticides. All right. No bat is going to want to eat moths that have chemicals on them because you just sprayed it all over your garden. All right. They're not. Gonna, that's not good. All right. That's bioaccumulating in their systems. All right. That's going from each level up. Starts in the insects. Right. And then somebody eats the insect. Now they have it. And then somebody they all have it. Right. Now we've got bats that are just full of some type of weird herbicide that you just sprayed in your garden. All right. That's no good either. And then use its head, installing an artificial resource, right? All right. They also don't like electromagnetic pollution. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep, just have to be mindful all around. Correct. All right, so that brings us to the moth and butterfly gardening, which um, most people are terrified of insects. If I said, that, let's do an insect garden, you would be like, uh, no way, no way at all I'm going to do an insect garden, right? But now if I tell you, all right, let's do a moth and butterfly garden, Oh yeah, let's do it. I found some really cool plants to add on this. Let's go get them. You know, that's an insect, right? So uh, the biggest problem about moth and butterfly gardening is this. You go to the store, okay, you buy butterfly bush, which unfortunately is not native, okay, and you think that that's it. I'm done. Butterfly bush, I'm gonna have a really nice butterfly garden. Everything's gonna work out really well. It's not the case because most of these plants only provide the nectar source for adults. Right? They're not doing anything for the larva. Right? So, for example, a gulf fritillary may like to uh, consume milkweed nectar. Okay? But when it comes to the larva, uh, it, it actually prefers things like black cherry or silky dogwoods or red oyster dogwood trees around. So now, they may be coming and eating on your property. Right? But he's not staying there. And what's the point of this? It's not about attracting him. It's about sustaining wildlife. Right? You want them to stay there. You want them to feel comfortable. So when you consider the plants that you choose for your wildlife or for your moth or butterfly garden, you have to consider both. All right? You have to consider what's going to attract them and what's going to keep them here. Yes? What's, isn't there a problem with the non-native um, milkweed? It matures later. So the monarchs are staying here later, and then of course, on the, if it's a native plant, they're already consumed, and they're on their way south. Correct. The other stuff, they have to wait around Correct. for that, and now right. they're subject to freezing. Absolutely. <laughs> correct. Yeah, 100% 100, 100 correct. Right. Yeah, and that's, but the, that's, that's the point of using native plants, right? It's because everything, all, the butterflies know when the plants are blooming. They know when they're not going to be in bloom. They know that they're going to be in bloom on their time of passage. So that's why it's important to utilize th those specific native plants, right? And if you're talking in, too about the monarch butterflies, you know those big expansive areas of green grass, those, that dude does nothing. Like those areas, those agricultural areas that we're losing to developments and stuff, but that's a big problem because monarchs actually will utilize those meadows, you know, before the farmer comes in and tills. Uh, they're using those things, you know. But when we build a big mall or parking lot. And they, there's nothing to utilize there, you know? so they're just they're passing by. Because I'm yeah. sure, I mean, thousands of years ago, plants and animals, they evolved together. Absolutely. And so well, they look, are custom, they're, it's in their DNA. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, look at the case of the shag, the shag bark hickory and the bat. Hmm. I mean, with anything, there is going to be some type of relationship. You know, um, there's much more relationships that we, we aren't aware of than you would think. All right. I mean, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, for example, it's a fungus that actually lives on the roots of, there's so many different species that lives on the roots of the different plants. 
they actually have a commensal relationship. So they're actually feeding the plant and getting something themselves. And that's stuff, there's stuff under the ground we don't even know what's going on, you know? It's my concept, that's why people from across the pond right. come here. Right. They have to get in Indian knife. They have to get cut. They have to get as native as possible. Right. the natives understand right. the concept of what you're talking about. Yes, it's exactly. It's their religion. Right, exactly. It's exactly what it is. You know, if, if, if they taught the sky woman, the falling of the sky woman to the earth in classes, yep. as a, you know, they would understand. Right, right. I understand. Instead of Genesis. Right. No, I know. I know. Um, uh, so what was I going to say? Butterfly bush. Do you get anyone have those in their garden? You do. You do. But no, really. No, no. It's understandable. Because you went, you went to the store, right? And you saw butterfly bush, and you saw, you know, attract butterflies, right? Right. That's what we get. That's what we get when we go to the nursery. We get all these exotic plants that people are selling, and we think that's okay. But. It's so easy to locate native plants nowadays. There's plenty of resources out there. There's plenty of, you know, uh, native uh, native nurseries that you can actually go to. You can buy your seeds online. You get them shipped to you. You plant them. You have fun. And then you plant them the following year. All right. So staying with the natives is essential. Okay. Butterfly bush is not native. All right, you, do, you know, you can you can plant it if you like, but it's not native. Just know that it's only giving them, you know, food resource for you know for the adult. That's it. All right, in any butterfly garden, butterfly weed is essential. You need to have it, right? Because one, say, swamp milkweed can attract up to 15 different types of butterflies. All right, so swamp milkweed, um, common milkweed, any milkweed that you can plant that's native, you want in your garden. All right, you want that diversity. Uh, cone flowers, you say cone flowers, right? There's native cone flowers. They look nothing like the ones that you find at the store, but they're native. All right, you look online, you can find them. All right, but most likely if you find them in the store, they're not going to be native. Black-eyed Susans, all right, that's a huge one. Button bush, Joe Pye weed, anyone ever heard of Joe Pye weed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Joe Pye? Yeah. Yes, you have a farm, don't you? Do I have yeah. a farm? Yeah. No, I, I know pretty but, much the native stuff. Okay, well Joe Pye, which is this one right here, all right, that's a wetland plant. All right, but it does it does okay in marginal soils. You know, it's a little dry, a little wet. All right, it smells amazing, and it gets maybe about eight to ten feet tall. It just gets really, really big, but it attracts so many different species. Right? Um, again, dogwoods, black cherry trees, stuff like that. That's what we want to plant. All right, you want to think diversity. All right, when you're talking about butterflies and moth gardening. All right, and remember, it's. Um, it's really about, it, you know, while your plants are your foundation, you know, the plants are what's going to attract the insects, all right? And the insects are going to feed everything else, all right? This is, this is a whole, the whole cycle that we're looking at here, all right? We can't just throw some stuff out there and expect to get, you know, what we want. You know, you have to, you have to, you have to work towards it, all right? It starts with the plant community that you have, all right? There's our monarch butterfly, all right? Right. All right. All right. So, if I was to give you some words of advice, I would say, educate yourself. You use those online resources. You, know, you like certain species of wildlife. Right. Find out what they like. Find out what the habitats are. And you ask a professional too. There's nothing. There's plenty of people that you can ask. All right. Whether they be at the state or, or local level. Transition slowly. Do not become overwhelmed. All right. Do not go home and say, I'm going to take down this 100 acres right over here and I'm going to plant all these different types of trees and bushes and stuff and I'm going to get exactly what I want. Because you will get overwhelmed and you'll say, you know what, forget it. Right? It's kind of like wake up tomorrow and saying, you know what, I'm going to lose 30 pounds this week. Yeah, you know what, I don't really want to do that. I really want to go get a big you know, burger or something, you know. Oh, it's, it's about taking a small area on your property and starting with that and reaping the re rewards, all right? Because one of the things that one of the things that is awesome about this project that you can do is, is observing it while it happens. You have this small plot and so you have all these different types of plants, but until you walk over and you observe that inconspicuous little insect that's on there, 
and that little butterfly that's over there, well, then you're not really reaping the rewards of anything that you've done. Right? I mean, you, that's what you have to do. You start small, you build it up, you get excited, and you move over and you start a plot over here too. And you, then you start over there as well. Then you start working on something over here. Right? So start slow and build it up, build it up. That's all. Basically, they'll teach you. Yeah, they'll te exactly. Exactly, they'll teach you. If you're, if you're observant enough, if you're, if you're a naturalist, right? if you're out there and you're looking and you're writing things down or just... Just going out and having, you know, having a cup of coffee and watching your butterfly garden and watching the different insects that come in. Well, then, you know, that's it's a huge win. Um, another another thing that's really great about this is you get to release your artistic expression in all the monotony that we're seeing and all the same bushes and the same landscapes that we see every day when we're driving driving by. Um, you know. Being able to do something different is, is quite neat because you get to be artistic, right? You get to put different plants out. You get your neighbor to drive by and say, "What are they doing?" You know, it's, you're, you're you're involved in in the creation story. That's right, and you get to share that with them. They don't understand that, right? Because you are going to have to incorporate your family, all right, and your friends and your neighbors to talk about it. Hey, guys, come on over here and see the garden I just put in. You know, this is why I did it. I said, oh, hmm. Maybe we should do something like that. I think our child would really enjoy that. Because there's nothing more special than watching, say, a gulf fritillary or something land on a plant that you put in the ground specifically for him. You won. You got him to come by. All right? And, of course, have fun. That's what it's all about. <laughs> so, my dog definitely got the fever again. <laughs> all right? And I hope you caught it. And before we talk a little bit more... There will be a big snapping turtle show in August. Wow. <laughs> and um, snapping turtles are my, uh, they're my favorite. And uh, ever since I was a small boy, I, I would go down to my local pond and catch them. And I, 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 I shouldn't, should have done this, but I didn't know because I was a child. I would drag them back <laughs> on the road. And uh, by the tail, <laughs> naturally, which I should not do. And uh, my mom would yell at me and said, you know, if you bring them back, we'll, you know, we'll go to the pet store and get you some, some lizards or something and keep them. And I said, okay. Well, we do this show every year for the Columbia County Land Conservancy. And a number of kids come out and they have a great time. They all get pictures with them, right? And they have, they have a super good time. You get to learn a lot about their ecology and what they like and why they're considered a keystone species. All right? And when I say keystone species, I mean a, a, a species that is vital to the community. All right? A species that is taken out the entire community would fail, right? So that's going to be in August, so... I, so if you pick them up by the tail, is it not, not it's, good? It's like dangerous for them? Or it's dangerous, yes, yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah, no, you can never... Should just a little, you know, the only time we were, when we were at the animal hospital, somebody right. had brought one in that was semi-dead. Yeah. And we brought it back to life and we kept it in a cage and put it in a yeah. bathtub every day and got yeah. seaweed from the local right. lake and right. fed dog food. Right. And after a while, it started getting dangerous. Yeah. So it was, you know, a little scary to pick up this right. thing that was about this big, sure. you know, every day and, you know, put it in there. Sure. Finally, we were able to release it. Right. But, you know, no, it's, it's, like, our frame, you know, it was okay because it was rehabilitated. But some you see on the road, you kind of like think twice if you're going to, right. you know, grab them like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, does this, it, this is does a, it damage them if I pick it up or they just don't like it? Well, well the problem is, is that their tails attack their tail, which is the vertebrae, right. okay? It's attached right to the <coughs> top of their shell, all right? Okay. So when you pick them up like that, they're, you're popping their vertebrae, yeah. and you can actually cause them to actually lose feeling in the back of their legs. So it's something that you don't want to do. No. And anyone that ever has questions about how to pick up a stabber or what can or can't they do, yeah. this is the show for you, because I will show you how they can turn into nothing but a mush yeah. in someone's hands, mm -hmm. because they're one of the more timid and relaxed creatures on this planet. And just because they were given the name snapping turtle, I mean they've got they've got a bad target on their back, all right? Yeah. But these this this species right here is remarkable. It's a remarkable animal. They can still do some damage. Yeah, so, they, they, they can, but I I picked up thousands of snapping turtles off my yeah. day. And I've been bit one time. In your hand? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Got all your fingers? I, I do. Mm -hmm. They actually have they actually have terrible aim. <laughs> terrible aim. You would think that they were intoxicated. Yeah. No, no, really. They terrible aim, and they cannot reach all the way back to the back part of their shell. Um, 
No, that's why you pick them up. I won't do that anymore unless right. it's an emergency. Well, they, they can only reach, they can't, they can barely reach back to the mid part of their back either. So they've actually got terrible aim. They really can't reach around too far. And if most of the time, if they bite, they release. And if they even can get you, which is, you know, a pretty slim chance, that they're going to let go. Yeah. So, but this is a 55 pound male. So in the record books, they talk about some of the big ones being like 56, 57. Mm -hmm. It's a big animal. Yeah. I, I saw two big ones in the back side of Farrell Lake. I don't know if you know where Farrell Lake is up in Exus uh, no. uh, County. Okay. They were about three and a half inch diameter shells. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah that's big. Yeah, that's yeah. big. That's a big male. Yeah. Right. And at that point, the annuli or growth rings around their shell are actually gone at that point. Right. Yeah. So at that from from that point, you understand that they're 35 years or older. You know, they're 50, 60, 70, 80. Good luck. Right. Until you want, unless you want to do some blood tests. Right. But that annuli, that little growth ring, similar to what you find around a tree that you cut down. All right. That's present around the top part of their shell. All right, which is called their carapace. All right, that's what that little ring is, and you can count the little rings to determine round about what their age is. Right. So that's that's in August. So really cool show. We usually get a lot. What's that? What's the date? I I don't know if they put it on their website or not. The Columbia <laughs> County Lake Service would tell you. Where is that? Uh, that's up. Uh, that's uh, what is it? What's the name of that lake? Oh boy, what is the name? It's in uh, it's in Chatham. I know it's in Chatham. Yeah, it's in Chatham. But it's, it's a great show. I mean, I'll tell you, people just they love it. Just because you get to go out, check staff and trail traps, and get muddy, see big turtles, and you know, it's good stuff. A lot of pressure for me because I have to catch the turtle. So, but, uh, <clears throat> so right now, really the slideshow is just for talking points, all right? Because I, it's very difficult for me to be able to get into the, all, all the details of specific animals and specific habitats, okay? So this is where we talk, we talk shop, essentially, right? We talk about what you want to see, or we talk about um, specific types of animals, what types of plants would work best, what type of soil would work best, where can I go to get this, where can I go to get that? That's why I'm here, right? So we talk about what you can do around about to help animals on your property, but now you get the opportunity to ask me right now, what plants, what plants can I use? What animals are in my area? Or uh, do I have a wetland on my property? What kind of wetland plants can I put in? No, I mean, wetlands are my specialty. So if you have a wetland on your property, now's the time to ask. Because so I'll tell you, I'll tell you the Latin name, I'll tell you the size they get, anything you want to know. Um, I live in a condo development that was, was a wetlands. I grew up there, actually. It was okay. my playland before. Yep. And uh, when I grew up, and they built these ponds, and a couple times during the summer, they put chemicals in them to keep the vegetation from like overgrowing uh, crop. What else can they do besides that? Besides, well, I mean, not knowing the exact situation is hard for me to yeah. entirely say, but if they're going in there to for... There's for, snapping turtles in there. Right. Well, if they're going in there for mitigation purposes, which means that they did something at one point and now have to mitigate for it, and they're spraying down an invasive species, okay, because sometimes they go in there, they'll actually spray the plants, and if they're spraying a plant known as like Phragmites yeah. or some other type of wetland plant, mm -hmm. that might be something that they're required to do by a permit or law because of something they did, they've done in the past to harm a wetland. So mm -hmm. I can't tell you for sure, but what I can tell you is they wouldn't allow anyone to go into a wetland and spray plants it's just, terrible. just because. Yeah. So it's likely because it's an exotic species. Right? Now, there's plenty of opportunity, other ways that you can you can reduce that, okay, depending on the type of plant it is. You can, uh, you can lay down like a certain type of fabric, actually, along the entire wetland, right? So you keep it blocked in certain spots. You can't do the whole thing, but in certain spots, right? Remember, less is better. Don't get, don't get too, uh, too overwhelmed, right? But that's the, other, that's the other thing that they can do. Uh, but if they're going in spraying plants, it's usually because it's an exotic just, species. They just spray the pond. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's usually because it's an exotic species of some sort in there. It could be, it could be water chestnut. It could be a number of different things. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, they do that all the time. All right? they, they, that is not an abnormal practice, unfortunately. I heard that there was something else you could put in that, would, that was natural. That would... There is nothing that you're going to be able to put it into in the... like one of the Wildlife Conservancy magazines okay. or something. Like it's very hard for me to believe, other than mechanical or like mechanical excavation, as if okay. you're pulling plants, 
or through biological control, such as introducing you know, a, a native, native species yeah. or something. Um, but chemicals, I don't trust at all because you know what? We said that a million times before in the past, mm -hmm. and it's always come up to burn us. So, yeah, you know, yeah, wetlands too. Yeah, wetlands. It's wetlands. Yeah. They're supposed to be the, the clean your outer things. Exactly. So. Yeah. They're essential. Yeah. Other questions? I mean, really, ask me specific plants, anything. I don't. Go ahead. Where do you get mushroom inoculation things? Uh, is that interesting? Yeah. Well, like, I've, heard, I've seen it done and everything. Yeah. Like, I just have never known where you actually yeah. get it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, sure. But if anyone's interested, and I think someone else was interested too, because I saw them writing quickly or something. But um, mushroom inoculation stuff you can find online, all right? Actually, like, you know, Google, you know, mushroom inoculation stuff. Um, there's a number of different suppliers that you can use, and essentially what it is is it's a little a spore plug, right? And if someone just recently cut down a tree that you know of, and it's a five or six foot log, um, a three inch diameter, maybe maybe this, this about this this thick, you know, um, you go around and you start drilling the log, and you actually put the spores into the log. Okay, you start pounding them in everywhere, and depending on the species that you choose to to grow, um, you should see mushrooms anywhere from Know, six months to maybe ten months, mm -hmm. depending on the species they use. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the important thing uh, with mushroom logs is um, each species requires something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you are choosing, say, chicken of the woods mushroom, which mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of, it's just absolutely delicious. It's like eating chicken, but it's a mushroom. Um, chicken of the wood mushrooms grow really well on conifers. So if you have a dead, even this is another opportunity too. If you have a dead conifer on your property or is dying. And you want to keep it as a wildlife resource. You go and you drill and you put in these spores into the logs. And then you wait, you know, maybe 10 months later, you have a huge log or two tree full of chicken of the wood mushrooms. Now you're eating something and you're still providing the space for wildlife to, you know, have a home. Right? It's just, it's about being kind of, um, you know, you just got to find those unique ways, you know. But um, so, anyway, so the, the chicken of the wood mushrooms do well in the conifers. All right. Um, you can um, do turkey tail. You can even do uh, turkey tail mushrooms um, or lion's mane mushrooms. Do well in red maples and oak trees. Right. Keeping them well hydrated is important. Mm. Keeping them next to your garden that you spray with water. That way you can also spray mushroom mm. logs out as well. All right. Um, <clears throat> some of them like to be up standing. Some of them like to be laying on the ground. Right. So. It works really well for small spaces. If you have a small yard or something, a small backyard, you want to try it out. It's fun. It's exciting because you get to see all the mushrooms just pop overnight. You get this big rainstorm. You go out the next day, and all of a sudden, it's just this this rainbow on this on this lot. And you're like, oh my, look at all this. You start picking them, and you, before you know it, you're like, oh, I'm gonna go in and have you know have some mushroom mushroom omelet. Absolutely delicious, nice and fresh. And oh, and then we let me roll it over here for a minute. And now, oh look, I've got two or three different species of salamanders underneath that. I didn't even think we're staying there and having a home. But now, they're good, I'm good, all works out. Any other questions? Is it, did I answer your question about that? Yes. Okay. But yeah, they come in packets of like, I think 50 to 100 or yeah. something like that. About 100 of them will inoculate one lot. Yep. So, yes? Red berries for bluebirds and other birds? All, all types of berry shrubs mm -hmm. that you can plant? Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay, this is the good stuff. Um, I would highly recommend High bush blueberry, and I've oh, ever heard of actual blueberry bush. Oh yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, most people don't know this actually. This is interesting, right? Because you go to the you go to the store, right, and you buy blue you buy blueberries, right? And you're like, oh, but must blueberries. But while you're doing that, I'm walking around a swamp eating blueberries off of a high bush blueberry plant because they exist here in, the, in right here in New York State. Yeah, I, I, I got five of them on my plant. Right, and do you get blueberries from them? You do, right? And they're delicious. They are delicious. High bush blueberry, it does well in you know pretty much any setting. But if you have an area on your property, say where like you can say your septic comes out, or it's just like a little bit wetter, you know, they do really well there because high bush blueberry is technically a wetland plant. It's technically a wetland shrub. However, some wetland shrubs or wetland plants are able to actually inhabit areas in the uplands, right? So high bush blueberry would be highly recommended for something like that. But I'd also say stuff like choke cherry, choke cherry, uh, choke berry, of course the snowberry that we, we saw. There's even low bush blueberry, 
So she's a really popular one. <coughs> and then the one that I like actually the most is service berry. Service berry. Yep. It's uh it's a very tall, tall shrub to small tree. Has brilliant white flowers in the springtime. Brilliant white. And here's the really cool thing about it. Side bush. What's that? Side bush. Yeah, side bush. Yeah. Root, exactly. But root, what's really cool about this bush is that it's shade tolerant, too. So if you have like a forest of stand on your property and you want to spruce it up with a little bit of color, there you go. It's a shade tolerant shrub. Now, it may not be as brilliant white as it would be in the sun, but it's still going to have plentiful flowers every spring. So that's also a really cool shrub. The high bush blueberry is well in the shade as well. Uh, <clears throat> another really cool, if you're into like tinctures and tea making and stuff as well, uh, witch hazel is a very popular shrub for that as well. And that is a shade tolerant, a 25, 30 foot shrub. It grows very quickly. It's an excellent resource for deer, um, chipmunks, squirrels, really good wildlife resource. Uh, and of course, you're into eastern blue, uh, bluebirds, sure. right? So you have a very open area on your property. Uh, or no. Well, yeah, we do across okay. the street. Okay. Well, that's okay. That's perfectly fine because if they're providing the flight corridor, okay, and you have a property that's more or less forested. Yeah. Or, backyard. Okay. Back in a cliff down to a stream. Okay. So if you have that, you could very easily install the shrubs along your tree line or something. Right, so they've got the flight corridor, right? But you've got the, the food opportunity, so you will see them on your property. Good. Okay, so don't just because you don't have everything that they need, sometimes you got to look at your neighbor's property and say, what do they have that I don't have? Okay, well then I'm going to put this on my property because I'll, now we're going to share. Now we're going to share the uh, share in the uh, the game basically. And then of course they go and do something and change it all up, and you're like, oh boy. Okay. So. We have a holly tree on our. Holly? Sure. Yeah. It's, you know and what kind of holly? I don't, but I do see birds eating the, the um, yep. berries in the winter time. Right. Yep. Right. Uh, oh, that, that brings, actually brings me to another one, I'm sorry. The American cranberry is actually another, another good one to plant. Mm -hmm. But hollies, there's, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of native hollies, but most of them are actually exotic. Mm -hmm. I will say that. Uh, some, of the, some of the exotic shrubs that you definitely do not want to plant while we're on this topic is you don't you don't want to come anywhere in contact with multiflora rose at all. Um, you ever hear of multiflora rose? Does it have another name? No. No, multiflora rose is a terrible, terrible exotic shrub. Um, you don't even want to come in contact with it because you don't want to move it anywhere else. It's just it's disgusting. I spend a lot of my summer cleaning up people's properties that are just bound by multiflora rose. It's just a very evil shrub. I've been battling over certain rose. It's probably the multiflora rose. And it just keeps. Yeah, it keeps coming up. Keeps. Yeah, it's terrible. It will choke. It will choke out an entire tree. Entire tree. It will choke out the entire thing. Kill it. And then when you go take it off, I mean, it's just it's a disgusting shrub. Yep. Now, autumn olive is another one. It's a terrible shrub. Um, I'm sure you know plenty. Phragmites is you know that's a popular wetland plant that's terrible. Um, well, garlic mustard. You want to garlic yeah. mustard. Eat terrible. all that if you possibly can. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> garlic mustard is terrible. Yeah. All the, yeah. So, any other questions? More? Yes. Uh, what's a good way to uh, get cattails into your area? Get cattails. To plant cattails by roots or? Oh well, really. I mean, what's really cool about them is you can plant them in a number of ways. As you know, I'm mean, a seed. Plant them by root if you'd like. I right? try and plant them by the seeds and. Just doesn't work for you. Work. Yeah. Well, you know, in that opportunity, if you have an opportunity to legally move, say, a cattail clump from one section of your property to the other, mm -hmm. that's what I would recommend. All right? Because you simply you're just cutting one side off and just picking the whole thing up, plopping it down, and then it's, gonna, it's just going to start to spread. Mm -hmm. Do you have a lot of an open water pond, or do you have something that is has like a littoral shelf and then drops down? It, it's. I guess just the low body area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, but the stream comes through. Right? The stream comes through. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, cattail will do well. Cattail is a good shrub or a good 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 wetland plant. Um, it tends they tend to call it a little bit more of a uh, like a weed because it does grow so quick. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if 
if there was some wetland plants that I would recommend for anyone's anyone's like wetland, if they could legally do it, is uh, so pickerweed. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. Pickerweed is a butter is a huge, huge butterfly and hummingbird attractant. Mm -hmm. Like huge. And the awesome thing about it that people don't get, what's what's most annoying about getting a flower, right? It's gone in like a week and you're like oh, that flower is awesome, now it's gotta go wait till next year's seed. I just spent sixty dollars on this thing. Mm -hmm. Pickerweed, May through October, brilliant, brilliant purple flower on it. It's all year long. I mean, it's just a great plant to pick. And it's a wetland plant, but if you have an area where, say, you know, water cycles off your roof and it's constantly getting wet or something, or you, you want to just water it more often, plant pickerweed. Is it sun or shade? Sun. sun. And we'll do okay in the shade, but like most plants, like, like fruits, for example, um, they'll live in the shade. You know, they'll do okay, but they're not really going to come to fruit, or maybe the flower's not going to be as good. Pickerweed's a good one. Pickerel? Pickerel. Like a, a P I C K E R E L weed. Yeah. Pickerweed's a good one for that as well. Yeah. And then marsh marigold is another one. Marsh marigold's I, good. I, 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 yeah. You have marsh marigold. Yeah. yeah. Um, Where it comes out of the pond when you can that right. Right. down into the. Correct, right? Yeah. Yeah. On the red, uh, ledges and stuff like that. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, there, there, there are many different wetland plants that you can plant. Many. We have a wetland a couple, maybe six houses over. Oh, yeah. They have to cross a road. Let's say like turtles have to cross a road to get to us. Yeah. Is there any chance we could get some of that action over in our yard? <laughs> hey, get turtles to be in your yard? <laughs> yeah, like, I, I know they, they roam. Because we have but had the, the opportunity, couple. right, the opportunity for you, not, not knowing your property, is your property, is your property, property squishy, squishy at all? Does it go wet, wet? We have a high water table. Okay. And so with a really good rain, we get a lot of really nice standing puddles in the back. All right, so here's the thing, right? A lot of people don't understand is that they actually can have a wetland on their property and not, not know it. When we, when we look at a wetland, right, when most people drive by, you, when you, think wetland, you think of the Florida Everglades, right? You think of this, this area that's got tons of water in it, and, you know, there's alligators flying around, and, you know, that's what we, that's what we think of. But in actuality, right? All, all that we need to create a wetland or have a wetland on our property is three things, right? We need to have hydro, we need to have hydrology, okay, so water, okay? And that water is gonna change the soil on the ground to make it hydric, okay? And then that soil is gonna result in hydrophytic or water-loving plants. So we need those three things on our, in our, on our property to actually call it a wetland, all right? And sometimes what happens is we may have a, a wetland that doesn't really look like a wetland on our property. But then when we cut our yard in, okay, and we stop mowing on that section of the yard because you dig down into the ground and say, oh, I can't, I can't get in there, you know, so I'm just going to leave that, let that grow up. Most likely that's a wetland. You don't even know it. So now you have an opportunity. You probably have a wetland. Right. So now, listen, here's the thing, right? That pickerweed I was just telling you about, guess what? You could do a whole area of just pickerweed. We'll just plant it and see what happens. Right. So... That's just, yeah, but not just pickerweed because what do we want, right? What do we want? We want, we want diversity, right? Because we want to attract a number of different things. So what you're doing, right, for the turtles that are hoping to be able to cross that road, right? I know, I know. Believe me, I know. Every year I do a little thing where if you tell me that you save a turtle, I clock it up, whatever. If you get, if I get to 100, I walk to the store in a turtle outfit. So trust me, <laughs> I'm all about turtles, right? I love them, all right? But you're providing that wildlife corridor, that safe zone for turtles to be able to pass through. But there's one other thing that you can do too. You can till up a portion of your yard, okay, every April or every May and keep it till. Because turtles that are roaming are, do, are go, roaming for two reasons. Males are going spots to certain different ponds to catch females, to find new girls, all right? Or females are impregnated and they're finding somewhere to lay their eggs. Right? So if why do you think that they always go to the mulch beds, right? And your gardens because it's all it's tilled, it's loose soil, and that they can get in the ground, lay their eggs better. Inside of the road. And inside of the road. One of the reasons why the side of the road too is down it's just loose soil, but because of the heat that's produced from the pavement. Mm. And those turtles come out a lot sooner too, because if the temperature is actually higher in the nest, mm. they're actually gonna they're gonna hatch faster. Mm. And that's a terrible I mean terrible spot, right? But <laughs> That's what they do. 
You know, there's some place where I don't remember where it was. I've seen turtle crossing signs. Yeah, still, but and that's a mitigation measure. I don't know how you, you know, yep. get that, those installed, but right. that's, you know, at least it will maybe save a few of them. Right. Yep. You can, that's a mitigation measure usually too. And some people that are going to, they're going to uh, work in areas that have a threatened or dangerous species of turtle are required to put up signs like that. That's a mitigation measure usually. Yes, sir. You want to tell them, don't mention about the box turtle do not disturb them, don't pick them up, don't move them. Oh, the box turtle. Because the box turtle has their, they use their same den after years and years and years. Yep, yep. Yeah, there's a, there's a very large population over at James Barrett State Park that I've worked with in the past mm -hmm. for box turtles. Um, it's actually a great sight to see. A good dear friend of mine, who unfortunately she passed away not, not too long ago, she's the one that introduced me to the population. And, uh, they're, it's incredible. It's a incredible spot. I mean, some of these turtles are brilliant. Better than any diamond. I mean, they're glorious looking. Um, where in their park? James Bear State Park. You know, where in the park? All over? Take your pick. All over okay. the place. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you, but, uh, yeah, they're just they're spanned all over the place. A good opportunity for you to actually look into what, what Eastern Box Turtles prefer in their habitat, because then you'd be able to find them. All right. Okay. All right, so maybe some uh, slightly wetter areas because although they're a box turtle, they're still considered a semi-aquatic turtle, so they need some type of water. Mm -hmm. right. So you're going to want to look for areas that are not too deep, but areas that are enough for them to get ponded in. Yeah, I got a pond in mind. Yeah. Play the golf course. Okay. Okay, are you near at the... No, but I've been bird watching down there. Okay. Yeah, there's pl they're plentiful. We did radio transmitting. Radio tracking to find out where they're going and where they've oh, been yeah. and stuff like that is very cool. Yeah, eggs. We we actually we go out at night. We wait for the females to lay eggs. And then we we put uh, barriers around to make sure that they're you know they're to be protected. So there's pretty expansive operation going there. Very cool. But but yeah. So turtles. Yeah. So safe little uh, walking zone. Um, great suggestion. Ask your town whatever. Can I put up a turtle crossing sign? And lots of lots seasonally, of turtle. seasonal yeah. that, the, that the turtles are kind of yeah and you know what too a lot of like working groups like turtle conservation groups will actually give you money if the town allows you to put them up and then they put they put them right in so it's you know yeah sometimes I drive by the same spot in the spring waiting for turtles to cross the road because I know that that's like a very huge travel corridor right there across that, that road mm -hmm. you, know, you always see them so any other any other questions at all? None? No, I don't know. You're getting a lot involved with a lot of things. You could talk about if people right. have a woodlock, you know, proper wood, ginseng, and uh -huh. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, there's, 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 there's a pretty large mix of what, um, forest communities that are here yes. in the Northeast. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the more popular ones that we're going to find is. Uh, like mixed hardwood, so you know, oak trees, red maple trees, you know, with an underlayer of uh, witch hazel, maybe some uh, wood ferns underneath that, some um, some wild strawberry. Uh, hazelnut. Hazelnut. It's huge. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's a. a it's from. I like to pick them once in a while, but the, yeah. the the squirrels will get there way before. Yeah. Way before. Right. Before they even gather with the other nuts. Right. And that's that's and that's the other problem too is you're putting all these wildlife things in and you're hoping to get something from it. Oh, I like to go out and pick a couple berries or something, and before you know it, they're just they're taking everything. You know. Yeah. About 30 years ago, I took a workshop with one of the founders of Finhorn, mm -hmm. where they actually speak with the Davis of the the insects or the or the, yeah. the plants. And they would have phenomenal gardens here in, in Scotland, and they'd have rows of, say, if they had like 50, a row of 15 um, string beans, like 10, the first 10 rows would be perfect, and then the last few rows would be totally decimated. Right. Because they delegated those rows to the bugs. Right. So the bugs did not touch the other ones. Right. Yeah. This is all documented. There's books right. out on this right. and such. And honestly, yeah. to me, it's a perfect way to spend some of your winter. Is actually planning out what you're going to do with your property. Mm -hmm. You know, it really is. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, this winter's been terrible, right? And we're just we're dying to get outside. You're probably like, you probably looked at the Tivoli Library calendar. You're like, oh, you know, you go learn about wildlife and maybe just you know start being happy again about getting outside a little bit. You know, it's exciting. You know, so it's a great opportunity to start looking into your property and learning what you can do with it. You know, um, and 
one of the things I've noticed about my property last year with, with my garden that I have is you know, I started getting a lot of insect pests in the garden, but because I have a diverse community of, of plants, you know, native, I mean, native trees and shrubs and flowers and everything, I also have a large number of insect predators. Right? So while I may have a caterpillar you know, that is eating up my tomato plant, right, I've also got a vespid wasp that likes to kill caterpillars to keep them off of my tomato plants. Why? Because I've got the community around it to support that animal, right? So I guarantee you a guy that has a property like what we saw is going to have a serious problem with Japanese beetles because there's nothing around to eat the Japanese beetles. There's nothing there. But if the Japanese beetles are on my property, right, I may find, you know, five or six a year, but I've got the insect predators to take care of that problem. I don't have to invest money in going out there and spraying everything down. I don't have to do that because I've got the plant community around it to support that. And, you know, it can be as easy as getting a five pound bucket of goldenrod seeds or a meadow mix and going out on your property and just spraying it everywhere and just letting it grow. That's how easy it can be. Just, you're just, you created a diversity, you've now attracted in some new grassland birds. And because now that you have a community of grassland birds, you may start to see some owls around, or maybe you're going to start seeing some hawks, right? They're going to start taking shelter in your property. And maybe you say, you know what? I just put in, I just put in this meadow, and now we've got grassland birds, and, and, and because I have grassland birds, I've got some different types of snakes and stuff coming in. And the hawks have been kind of circling a little bit out, but I don't really have the, the, the nesting area for an owl on my property, right? I had the same dilemma. I built a huge owl box and put it up in the tallest tree I could find in the darkest part of my property because that's what they require and that's what they like. And I am hoping which I, that this year will be the year that I have an owl settle it, right? But now I've given him the opportunity to come and hang, to come to my property and to live there and be sustained because I've got the metal form, you know, you've got the forest, got everything that they need. That's why years ago, uh, the old barns, they would have the, the yes. uh, uh, opening in the top barn of the barn for their barn house to go there to roost. So yes. at night they would come and eat right. the mice that wouldn't feed the grain to the farmer on the farm. Yeah, yeah. See, some, see somewhere the problem is this. Somewhere, in my opinion, somewhere along this line, and I'm, I'm still a young man, but I mean, just somewhere along this line, we become very detached from our natural world, right? So it's just now where you start seeing people actually starting to return to stuff like this. It's just now where you start seeing people more interested in putting in these huge bat boxes or butterfly or moth gardens. You know, so people are starting to return to that sense of biophilia, like I said, mm. but We've got a long way to go, and the only opportunity that these, this wildlife has in our region and anywhere else is through each individual landowner. And I really, really mean that. I mean, I think buying up large pieces of conservation land are important, don't get me wrong, but it's the individual plots that will hopefully eventually connect to something bigger. Those, that's what's actually going to save people, right? Because people become aware that way, you know, and it's also fun for people that are engaged in it too, you know, and it, it allows you to become reconnected to something that's been lost. Um, and I just think it's a great opportunity for people to get outside and do things and learn and to really, um, you know, see what kind of good they can do. It's a mutual understanding. Yeah. Nature gives to us. We give it back. is. It is. It's right. Back and forth. Right. I but agree. the more we give, the more nature gives. That's right. Exactly. And we can benefit off the land and so can that. There's no reason why one of us it can be you know one of us can win and one of us loses.